uh, the yellow insert in your bulletin to kind of help you follow along today and uh, maybe help you be ready for your life group this week or uh, the Gods at War journal that, we've, that we're all working on. But what I want to do today as we continue our series, Gods at War, I hope to burst a bubble in some of your lives. So let me just ask you, begin by asking you, whom do you love? Who do you, who do you say, I love you to? Your, your grandkids, your brother, sister, uh, parents, children. Most people say, I love you quite a bit. I know I say it a lot. Uh, every weekend, last night when I finished calling my sister, I told her I loved her. I say it several times each week to my granddaughters and to my wife and to my son, John. Uh, so who is it that you, you tell, I love you? Think about that. Love is a word that's become so common that it's taken on many different shades of meaning. Those of you who know me well probably have been with me to Taste of Philly and know that I love Philly cheesesteaks. But you know what? I don't love them the same way I love my wife. I love Colorado. I think this is one of the greatest places to live. But I love Colorado differently than I love my grandkids. I love skiing. I love mountain biking. I spend every Friday up in the mountains. But certainly I don't love skiing and biking the way I love Jesus. Love is used in so many different ways. People make love to people they don't necessarily love. In fact, it really can't be called making love. It's just casual sex. God never intended sex to be casual, though. There's a big difference. There's a huge difference between the love that God speaks about in the Bible and the love that is common in our culture, the romantic love that is common in our culture today. In fact, romantic love has become one of the major gods in our culture today, one of the major idols. So on this Valentine's weekend, let me tell you the problem with romantic love. Our culture holds up romantic love as the greatest and noblest of pursuits. I mean, we're led to believe that the need for romantic affection is built into every single one of us so that we instinctively yearn for that tingly, bubbly feeling that we call falling in love. Do you know in my research, I found out that psychologists have actually invented a word for this phenomenon of falling in love. They call it limerence. Limerence. It means to fall so madly and passionately in love that it creates powerful chemical reactions in your body. Dopamine is released so that you have greater energy, less appetite, and this feeling of bliss. And I'm sure many of you can remember those kinds of feelings. Limerence is a strong emotional attachment to that comes over a person who is powerfully attracted to someone else. It's an overpowering infatuation that involves intrusive thinking. What's that? Not being able to concentrate on any other subject but the object of your affection. How these high school kids have little notes with, you know, with hearts about then the guy's name or the girl's name, you know, on their notebooks and stuff like that. The uh, it, it's putting that person on a pedestal where you don't see their faults. You know, you've heard the saying, "Love is blind," right? You don't see their faults. Agonizing over the possibility that your love is not going to be returned, that they don't feel about you the way you feel about them. And then limerence also has some physical effects, like heart palpitations and, and even paralyzing shyness when you're around the object of your attraction. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. This increase in dopamine also brings with it a decrease in serotonin. That's a chemical that helps us make wise decisions. So love is not only blind, it's also stupid. <laughs> At least that may explain why those who are heads over heels in love don't always make the best decisions. Doing crazy, spontaneous, often dangerous things that they would not ordinarily do. Not even thinking about it. Many young people, and even those who are not so young, spend much of their life in hopes of finding that one soulmate that exists on this planet just for them. Now, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a soulmate, as one woman for one man. So I hope you haven't wasted your time looking for that one person on that quest. God made you, all right? But God didn't make one man or one woman just for you, who will fulfill and complete you, who means everything to you. And if you're on that quest, you're going to be disappointed. For one thing, there are far more women on this planet than there are men. 
And besides, as Kyle Eidelman said in his book, Gods of War, uh, if there were such a thing as a soulmate for every person, it would only take one person to ruin it for all the rest of us. See, the whole balance would be out of whack. Somebody got your soulmate, which creates a domino effect, and we're all left holding the bag or marrying the bag, <laughs> as the case may be. Only Western culture has that concept. One man for one woman. You don't find it anywhere else in the world, any other culture. That's why you and I in this culture can't even comprehend cultures that have arranged marriages, but there are more cultures that have arranged marriages than there are cultures like ours. And you know what? Their marriages last because it's a commitment rather than just a feeling. So the idea of this one man for one woman this soulmate thing did not come from God. And that ought to be clear from all the polygamy in the Old Testament. That ought to give us some clue. The idea came from Western Europe. It came from the Middle Ages. It was popularized by Bill Shakespeare and all those medieval stories about the prince finding the princess and living happily ever after. Causing us today to believe that the great purpose of life is the pursuit of an emotional, dramatic, passionate, romantic love. For many, romantic love becomes the focus of their entire lives. And when we can't find it ourselves, we choose to read about it. Did you know that five and a half Harlequin romance novels are sold every second of every day, 365 days a year? Every second, five and a half. Look at how much of our music is about this kind of love. One song by a guy named Meatloaf even says, I will do anything for love. I really like that song. It has a catchy tune. In fact, I was listening to it when I wrote this sermon. But he goes on to say, maybe I'm crazy, but it's crazy and it's true. I know you can save me, no one else but you. And he is crazy if he thinks that any relationship on this earth, other than a relationship with God who loves him, can save him and give him hope and meaning and significance. In fact, I pulled up the lyrics because so much of what he says, as I listened to that song, so much I thought I could sing it to God as my love song to God. But there are two or three lines that make it clear he is talking to a woman about romantic love and not about the great lover of our souls. Now, God created romantic love. Romantic love is a good thing, but romantic love that is the great quest of our life, as our heart's obsession, as something we must have or be miserable without, is a human cultural invention. Like meatloaf. We look, you know, if, if we look to a romantic re relationship to save us, to, the mean, to be the means to our satisfaction and fulfillment, to be the missing piece to complete our lives, then that romantic love has become an idol. It's become our God. Romantic love is good. It's a godly thing. It's a great gift. There are nights, my wife doesn't know this, when I'm laying there in bed, I haven't gone to sleep yet, and she's sleeping, and I'm just looking at her thinking, what a beautiful woman. Thank you, God, so much for bringing her into my life. But when we make that romantic love essential to a meaningful life, we've made it our God. When we put our hope in romantic love and do anything for that love, make any sacrifice, then this beautiful gift from God has actually become his replacement in our life, and the gift becomes more important than the giver. If you would do anything for romantic love, or the object of your romantic love, then it's become your God. So as we start today, I just want to ask you, is it possible that a relationship with a person has replaced your relationship with Jesus and become an idol in your life? In Genesis 29, we find the story of Jacob and Leah. It's that kind of romantic love story that you would expect to see on reality TV, read about in scripture that's what I love about scripture it's, it just lays it all out there and it's a love story that takes a very unexpected turn it begins when Abraham's grandson Jacob falls in love with a young woman named Rachel 
Now, starting in verse 16, chapter 29 of Genesis, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older one was Leah, and the name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel. And he said, uh, he said to her dad, Laban, I will work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Jacob just loved her from, from the very get-go. It was love at first sight. And, and you'll notice, though, that Laban had another daughter, Leah, an older daughter. And she had weak eyes. Rachel was beautiful in form and in figure. Few women in Scripture have been so misunderstood as Leah. Because the translation, she had weak eyes, seems to portray Leah as a homely girl with pop bottle glasses, couldn't see three feet in front of her face. And that is completely unjustified. I, I did a little research on the Hebrew word that's translated weak there, and it's never used in a demeaning way anywhere else, nor is it ever used with a reference to any physical defect. Normally, that word is translated tender, gentle, or even delicate. I think the reference to her tender or delicate, gentle eyes may refer more to her personality. What I'm guessing is that Rachel had this fire or sparkle in her eyes. She had a very vivacious personality that enhanced her beauty, and that attracted uh, Jacob. Leah was also beautiful, but perhaps she was uh, more contemplative, you know, gentler, quieter. Certainly, Jacob's choice of Rachel was based more on his hormones than it was any other factor. God seemed to prefer Leah over Rachel. At least uh, she was the one that he initially blessed with all the children. Now listen to verse 20. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Isn't that a great verse on the Valentine's card, ladies? Very romantic. See, there's a completely irrational side of romantic love. You know, we have a hard time thinking objectively when we're filled with limerence. <laughs> uh, we, we don't think objectively about the things that we love. That's why for some of you this message is going to be a little hard to hear. Our emotions just get too involved that we don't see things clearly, and that's why we don't make good choices. After Jacob serves his time, we read in verse 21, at the end of seven years, Jacob said to Laban, the time is up. I've earned it, Buster. Give me my wife. I want to sleep with her. Now, that doesn't sound quite as romantic, right? But listen, you can't be too hard on Jacob. I mean, this was a seven-year seven engagement. That's a long engagement. This guy was ready for his wedding night. But all of a sudden, there's this soap opera twist. Look at verses 22 and 23. So Laban brought all the people together, all the people of the place, all the town, huge, you know, shindig, wedding feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah, not Rachel, and gave her to Jacob, and Jacob lay with her. Verse 25, when morning came, there was Leah. Jacob woke up expecting Rachel by his side, and he found Leah. How could that be? Well, the Bible says it was in the evening. Probably late in the evening, because it was toward the end of the wedding feast, he took his daughter Leah, brought her to Jacob. Normally, she'd be wearing a veil, and he went in to her. My guess, it was, you know, it was plenty dark. She had the veil on, and probably Jacob had been drinking too much like they tend to do at wedding feasts. At any rate, he didn't recognize Leah until the next morning when he saw her without the veil in the full light of day, and that would cure any hangover he had. He was probably furious, immediately pulled on his pants and hightailed it over to his in-laws, and Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you, gave you seven years for Rachel. Why have you deceived me? Now, the good part of the story is Laban did eventually give Rachel to Jacob to be his wife as well. So he had the two sisters. You know, that's bad from the start. <laughs> what did Jesus say? <laughs> no man can serve two masters. <laughs> so that wasn't good. Um, anyway, it was a huge mess. Leah loved her husband. And she wants more than anything else for him to return that love. But he's not really interested. 
in Leah. Rachel is the one he loves. And Leah embarks on a life of making romantic love her God. She spends her life hoping and dreaming of the day she will feel love from her husband. She makes it her life goal to win the heart of her husband, Jacob. And that's what she puts her hope in and the meaning of her life and the goal of her life. And so we see the devastating effects in this story of serving the gods of love. The one thing Leah has going for her, she is able to have children while Rachel, her sister, is not able to conceive. And so with every child that she gives birth to, Leah thinks, maybe now my husband will notice me. Maybe now he'll love me. Look at the beginning, I think, in verse 25, or 32. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, first son. She named him Reuben. For she said, it's because the Lord has seen my misery, surely my husband will love me now. I've given him a child. Didn't happen. So she conceived again. And when she gave birth to a second son, she said, because the Lord heard me that I am not loved, and he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Still didn't get love. Again she conceived. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. So she named him Levi, which is the Hebrew word for attachment. Giving birth to this third son, she just knew that Jacob would really be attached to her. Every time a child comes along, she thinks, finally, he'll love me. Finally, we can have a real marriage. It's what she wanted more than anything else, romantic love. It had become the God that she worshiped. And I think in our culture, it's really the idea of love that we worship. Because you think about it. I, I think of my granddaughters. We, we bought them princess dresses from the time they were little because they wanted them. They watched the Disney, you know, the Disney things and stuff like that. It's this, all these stories that we have learned that finish with the couple living happily ever after. So we end up putting that dream on the altar of our worship and bowing down to it in our culture. Romantic love is held up as the ultimate human experience. It is the subject of counseling books and inspired many beautiful works of art and literature and poetry. It's the plot line of innumerable mu uh, movies. Karen and I watched one last night. This girl, the guy finally did ride in on a white horse, you know. Uh, leave it to, what is that? Hallmark. John, isn't that the one you think? He calls me the chick flick guy. You know, I watched those with Karen. Uh, but you see what we do. It's, it's the theme of almost every song. Now, don't misunderstand. These relationships, I believe, are beautiful gifts from God. God is the creator of romantic love. Marriage was his idea. The problem comes when we allow those relationships to take the place of God and our love for him. When the gift becomes greater than the giver, when we expect to get from that relationship what only God can give us. You see, ultimately, nothing is more destructive to our love life than to put romantic love on the throne instead of God. It puts incredible pressure on the relationship because we're saying to that person, I want you to do for me what God alone can do for me. You've heard this song. Your love keeps lifting me higher than I've ever, want to sing along, been lifted before. So keep it up. What's the next verse? Quench my desire. Can't be done. No relationship can satisfy your desires, because you were made by God and you were made for God and only a relationship with Him can quench those desires. And as soon as you want your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend to quench your desires, you're putting a huge amount of pressure on them and given enough time and enough pressure, that relationship will start to crack. When you put romantic love on the throne of your life, you're never, ever going to be satisfied. Because nobody is going to be able to live up to that expectation. Eventually, every false god will disappoint you. It doesn't matter whether your god is money or success at work or sexual pleasure or a career or love. They all are going to disappoint. Rachel had a false god as well. 
Leah's goal was to win the, the love of her husband. Rachel already had that. What she didn't have in her life were kids. And so that desire, another God of love, became the false God in her life. It controlled her, and Rachel would do anything, even to the point of allowing her maid to sleep with her husband in order to give him children. That's what happens when we worship the God of love. You see, God created us. He made us in such a way that we are to be obsessed with him. We are to just be obsessed with God and who he is and what he's done in our lives and how he loves us. And when we get away from that, we become obsessed with other things. If he is not our most significant relationship, you see, the, the reason that's so important, getting hot. No, what I want to do is show you something. When you get dressed in the morning and you're, you're not paying any attention and then you start, you start putting these buttons up here, you know, and then, you know, you get them wrong, right? That's what happens in people's lives. And maybe this will help you remember when you get that first button right, all the other buttons fall in line. When you get your relationship with God right, when you put Him first, when He is really your sole desire, then your, every other relationship, your spouse, your children, your girlfriend, boyfriend, your parents, your friends, falls into place. If you're experiencing frustration in some of your relationships, it very well may be that it's because of idolatry. You've put somebody, some relationship ahead of God. And so before you try and fix that relationship by watching Dr. Phil or by buying the next you know, self-help book or even seeing a counselor, give your attention to making Jesus your greatest affection. Love him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and see what happens. When you make him number one love in your life, you will see how that changes all your relationships. Leah was desperate to find satisfaction from the God of romantic love. Every time she gave birth to a child, she thought, maybe now my husband will love me. But it never happened, and it never will. But she changed. Look at verse 35. She conceived again, number four. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will, what? Praise the Lord. And she named him Judah, which means praise God. She finally stopped looking to her husband. She'd been rejected by her dad. She'd been rejected by her husband. And she finally decided, I'm going to turn to God. And I'm going to praise the Lord this time. And she finally stops expecting other men, other relationships to meet the needs that only God can meet in her life. And God really changed things. Because Judah, I don't know if you even know this, but in Matthew chapter 1 we find the genealogy genealogy of Jesus. A lot of people just kind of skip over that. But it begins by saying Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob, this Jacob. And Jacob was the father of Judah. Leah's fourth son. And if you keep on reading in genealogy, you'll find out that down the line, born to her, her progeny was Jesus, the Messiah. He's even called in Revelation 5, 5, Jesus is called the lion from the tribe of Judah. God used her. Once she turned to him as her only desire, as the great love of her life, God used her to be the progenitor of Jesus God has great plans for us when we make him our God. Things fall into place. Doesn't mean we'll never struggle again. But it makes life completely different. Have you succumbed to the gods of love? Our culture has held for centuries that a person is somehow incomplete without a spouse. How'd Jerry Maguire say it? Who who was playing Jerry Maguire? Uh, Brad Pitt? Tom Cruise, that's it. I knew it was one of those good-looking guys. Tom Cruise. And it was uh, Rene Zellweger, I think. And uh, he says, you complete me. Not true. No human relationship will ever complete you. 
But see, we've got that idea in our culture. And maybe it originally came from the creation account in Genesis 3 when God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable, a companion suitable for him. And so God created Eve, and, you know, he'd given him all these animals, and Adam was naming the animals, and then he brings to him Eve. And you know what the Hebrew says when he saw Eve? Whoa, that's it. That's it. He realized she was way different than any animals. Certainly a girl over a goat, right? Whoa. It was an exclamation. Whoa, in the Hebrew. That's it. But see, God never said that a human being was incomplete without a spouse. He just said it was not good for the man to be alone. And he may have been particularly, probably was, referring to Adam, the first man, who obviously needed someone so he could have children with and fulfill God's command to populate the earth. Who was the most complete man that ever lived? This is not a trick question. Jesus. How many wives did he have? He had none. The most complete man that ever lived was not involved in romantic love whatsoever. If you thought for one moment that God believed that we could not be complete without a spouse, do you think he would have ever written this encourage singles and widows to remain unmarried. I should like you to be as free from worldly entanglements as possible. He says, the unmarried man is free to concern himself with the Lord's affairs and how he may please the Lord. But the married man is sure to be concerned with the matters of this world that he may please his wife. You find the same differences in the case of the unmarried uh, woman and the married woman. The unmarried concerns herself with the Lord's affairs. Her aim in life is to make herself holy in body and in spirit. But the married woman must concern herself with the things of this world, and her aim will be to please her husband. If you're not married, you can find your completeness in God much more quickly because you've got more time and more commitment to give to God. Now, don't misunderstand. Marriage is good. God certainly doesn't oppose marriage. In fact, he established it for our benefit, for our welfare, because he loves us so much. But as great as human love is, it can never be a substitute for God's love. Single or married, we find our completion, our lasting satisfaction, our fulfillment, our meaning and purpose in life only in God. We were created by him and for him. What happens, however, When we believe ourselves to be incomplete without a a spouse, we begin this relentless search. I mean, we put almost everything else on hold in our life until we find that one partner that will make our life complete. And the problem is, whenever we look to someone other than God to complete us, to meet our deepest needs, that is idolatry because God's the only one that can meet our deepest needs. He alone can complete us. The husband and wife relationship is a wonderful, joyful, precious gift from God. But it was never meant to replace a relationship with the giver of that gift, with our Creator. And to expect our spouse to meet needs that only God can meet places an impossible burden upon that relationship, and that's exactly why there's so many divorces in in America today. It It places incredible pressure. Don't ever expect your spouse to do what only God can do for you. When we look to any human being or any human thing, any earthly thing, to meet needs that only God can meet in our lives, that becomes our God. And no person can live up to that expectation. You're bound to be disappointed and become disillusioned. How many of you watched the Beatles uh, special this week on the day? How many of you saw it when they were originally on Ed Sullivan? Okay. How many of you watched it again this week? They were right, weren't they? All you need is love. Burt Bacharach hit the nail on the head. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. But it's a far different love than most people expect. All we need is the love of God. That's all we need to be full, complete, to be whole, to be healthy. He's the only one that can fill that void in our hearts, that deep pang of loneliness, that sense of emptiness that something is missing. Is simply God crying out within us for the fellowship, the relationship, and the intimacy that he, the creator of the universe, wants to have with me and with you. You and I were made for a love far deeper, far richer, far more fulfilling than what any human relationship can offer. We were made to experience God's love, a love that has no end, no bounds, no limit. As the song says, we've been looking for love in all the wrong places. 
God wants to give us that love that we have sought anywhere and everywhere else. A love that just goes on and on and on and on. That's where you find your identity. That's where you find your value. That's where you find your worth. That's where you find your hope. That's one thing that will never be taken away from you. God who cannot lie pledges to love you unconditionally. A love that will never, ever end. Every other relationship, every other thing has an end. But God's love is eternal, as eternal as we are. Everything else will fail us or disappoint us. A spouse, athletics, career, money, education, degree, success, some possession, they'll all disappoint us because they never last. His love alone never fails. It never wavers. It never ends. It is eternal as we are, and so it will satisfy us eternally. Don't find your your identity in your brains or in your beauty or in your brawn or, or, or in your, the bucks that you amass in life or even in your spouse. Find your, find your identity in him. And you'll never be disappointed. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, help us to find our satisfaction in you and you alone. To make you the love of our life, the focus of our affections and the center of our attention. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look on the back of your card, uh, connection card. Three steps, next steps, I'd encourage you to take. Number one, find my satisfaction and fulfillment in my relationship with God and my experience of his love rather than in the people or the things of this world. Second step you might want to take, take a look at my life. As you go through the Gods uh, Gods at War uh, combat manual, combat journal this week, examine the gods that I may be worshiping and not be aware of. I'll see if I'm making certain things or people a priority over God or letting them take his place in my life. And then thirdly, discover any idols or false gods like romantic love. And then confess that to a trusted friend and ask him or her to hold you accountable and to pray for you. Maybe meet for prayer. One, one of the things we're going to do at the end of this six weeks when God's of, of love, we have, we have almost 500, 435, 445 people in God's at War life groups each week. And when we're done with that six weeks, those of you who want to, who've decided you really are serious about dealing with these idols in your life, we're going to establish uh, growth groups, men's growth groups and women's growth groups, three people or four people at the most, where you can just meet together uh, maybe once, uh, you know, maybe once a week, maybe three, two, two or three times a month, and just you decide that how you want to do it. But encourage each other and pray for each other to deal with the idols that may be keeping you from loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's just something to think about uh, in the next month or so. God bless you.